If you want your cooking to move forward, to progress down the road toward carefree cooking, and it's not, well, maybe it's because you're asking the wrong questions. Asking the right questions for the answers that are going to give you confidence and pride in the kitchen? That's our topic today on the Carefree Cook's Code. I'm Chef Todd Moore, and this is the Carefree Cook's Code, every Tuesday live at noon Eastern. Here's our challenge. How can home cooks cook freely with creativity, confidence, and pride while ignoring recipes and still impressing themselves and others with what they cook? Well, the answer is found in becoming empowered with how cooking works, using dependable and repeatable methods of cooking that work for any ingredient, for any diet, and any desire, just like chefs do. And we'll know we've cracked it when everyone sees cooking as an exciting and rewarding way to improve their relationships, their lifestyles, and their health through better food and cooking. This is the Carefree Cook's Code. Hey, welcome back to the Carefree Cook's Code, everyone. Uh, This is the weekly show for methods, techniques, and insights into better food and cooking. We're live together every Tuesday at noon Eastern, and you can find all the past videos in the archive on Facebook. If you go to facebook.com slash chef.todd.more slash videos. And if you want to see what I'm cooking and how I did it, uh, you can follow Chef Todd on Instagram as well, because what you're going to see is me creating my own recipes, bringing friends and family together, learning every time I cook, on my way to creating my own cooking style. And this all happens because I practice pro methods and I love my cooking. That's how it works. Hello, carefree cooks all over the world. It's great to be back with you today. Tuesday, always my favorite day of the week because we get to chip away a little bit more at the chef's secrets and the skills that are gonna help us break that carefree cook's code, which means you wind up cooking with creativity, confidence, and pride. And To do that, (laughs) to to progress in any endeavor, you got to be a little bit curious, right? When you're curious, you have to ask questions. And Mark Victor Hansen may or may not know the name. He's best known for his Chicken Soup for the Soul books. You're, You're familiar with that now, right? You've heard of that. He puts it best. You can't get the right answers if you're asking the wrong questions. And he's absolutely right. If you're asking the wrong questions, you don't move forward at all. You you stay stuck right where you are. And I want to help you with that today. But first, uh, I've got a what am I for us today. It's the what am I. So we've talked about, I'll give you a hint. (laughs) Tell me in the comment section below, what am I? We've talked about mirepoix before. And in in French culinary, mirepoix is the combination of carrot, onion, onion, and celery. Right, Mirepoix. So... Over here, what is the combination of tomato, pepper, onion, garlic, and olive oil called with a little Spanish flag down there in Spanish cuisine? Okay, I know it's a tough one. That's why I'm giving you a lot of hints. The other hint is that it has seven letters. Okay, so what is this combination of things, seven letters, has something to do with Spain? Tell me what am I in the comments section below. So, hey, I'm so proud. Again, so grateful, so proud of all of you. I keep seeing your photos and what you're doing. Ah, my goodness, the pride wells up in me when I see the pride welling up in you. And I'm also grateful that you get to spend a little time with me every Tuesday. I I know it's valuable time. And I know you have to choose how you spend your time and you choose to spend it with me. So I just want to express my appreciation. And it's not just a few of you. It's always a hundred, hundreds of you. Our live cooking segments, hundreds, 800, 900, 1200 people. It's crazy. Easy. And, and I mean, I know you're not watching me because of incredible feats of strength, right? Or some kind of magic sleight of hand. I don't do any of those things. I don't, I can't sing. I don't play an instrument. Um, I don't draw. I can't paint. But there is one thing that I can do really, really well. And immodestly, I, I consider myself the best in the world at what I do. I, I ain't joking. I consider myself the best in the world. I'm a chef educator. Maybe educator first, then chef. 
There are plenty of chefs that are much better than I am. As for educators, I don't know. So let's call it educator chef. Well, wait a minute. That doesn't sound very good. Let's just say I'm a guy that solves cooking problems and answers questions. Let's just keep it that way, okay? I'm the best there is at solving cooking problems. And all right, maybe that's too many words, but look, I'm getting off on a tangent again. I don't care what you call me. You can call me anything you want because my mission will always remain the same. And this is my mission here. I read this at least once a week to myself because I need to know where I'm going. And then I need to ask the questions that are gonna get me there. I help amateur chefs who want to impress themselves and others by empowering them with how cooking works, using dependable and repeatable methods not taught anywhere else so they can ignore recipes and cook freely with creativity and confidence and pride. I have it memorized. I could say it without reading it, but you know something? I'll know that I'm successful when everyone sees cooking as an exciting and rewarding way to improve their relationships, their lifestyles, and their health. How powerful is that to have your written message? And whatever your personal message is, whatever your mission is, I'm going to be the best mother or father to my children. I'm going to be the best spouse today. Whatever it might be, studies have shown you write it down and it happens. That's my mission and I read it every day. Like I said, I have it memorized. And I think my mission has been quite successful, don't you? <laughs> the past 12 years of teaching online has created thousands of carefree cooks all over the world. Virtual classrooms filled up everywhere. These people that are ignoring recipes and they're finding their own path toward great cooking. And look, I said I'm proud for you. Uh, I'm proud of you, but, but I didn't do it. I, di I didn't do it for you. You gotta do it yourself. All right, maybe I helped you, but I can't force you toward better food and cooking. And the people that help themselves, which is everybody, right? They're the ones asking the right questions because when you ask the right questions, you get those aha moments. You're so much more likely to have those sudden realizations that, oh my goodness, I learned something I didn't know before and my cooking is moving forward. Great feeling, right? But the opposite end is true, that asking the wrong questions stops you in your tracks. It halts your progress immediately, and you know what? It might even be moving you backward. So when we're together live on Thursdays and Saturdays, I'm just amazed at how many people are focusing on the wrong thing. That how many people are focusing on the wrong questions and the wrong questions don't enable me to fulfill my mission. I want to help those people too. The, the wrong questioners. I want to help you because you're stuck. You you're spinning your wheels and you may never find your way out. You may never find your way to true freedom in the kitchen. And look, I don't answer wrong questions. It's not because I'm annoyed or anything. You know, I'm not a snotty chef, but I don't answer a wrong question because a wrong question can only send you down the wrong path. A wrong question can only yield a wrong answer. And what I mean by this is if I give you an answer with a wrong question, then it validates that question in your mind. And the person who asked the wrong question thinks it's the single answer to their cooking problem but it's not. So when I start cooking live on Facebook and I see a question like, how long do you cook it? Oh, chef, people type in furiously, how long, how long? Sometimes in big capital letters, how long, how long? <laughs> I know this person's focus is, is just in the wrong spot. Their focus is on the clock and not the food. So how long you cook something the answer is always the same until it's done. That's an easy one, right? But the right question to answer here, the right question to ask here is how do I tell when my food is done? Okay. If I didn't own a clock, if I had to go by a sundial, <laughs> which would be very, very uh, imprecise because being able to tell the effects of heat on food, right? It, and not just how long it's been cooking, you, you could cook something for four days and if it doesn't get to the point that you want it to get at, how long has nothing to do with anything. 
when somebody has got to know, hey, what brand? What brand? What brand of that? What brand of pan? What brand of knife? What brand of spoon? What kind of oven do you have? It's the wrong question. I want to help you get over this because unless your focus is shopping, unless your focus is on shopping more than cooking, the brand of something doesn't matter at all. Every brand has a high end and a low end. They can license their logos out to other companies and make cheaper products. Have you seen what's happened to Henkel knives? The, the two little red guy logo, right? There are $10 versions in Target right now. The right question to ask yourself is what characteristics am I looking for of that pan, of that knife, of that spoon? What characteristics are important to me? And that means a little bit of education on your part. Make your shopping decisions not based on the brand, but based on what you're trying to do, the characteristics. Learn what the pans are made out of. Discover what the knives are made out of. I had a woman, one of my very first and best students when I opened my brick and mortar cooking school in 2006, I think it was, little four foot three woman, older woman. She's small, she had little tiny petite hands and she came at me one day with this 12 inch chef knife and she wanted to know if this was a good chef knife. Yeah, it was a very good chef knife. Not for her. <laughs> Not for her petite size, her small hands, a 12-inch chef knife. Wrong. So the brand has nothing to do with it. Similarly, uh, hey, chef, uh, what do I do if I don't have a gas stove? Uh, or, uh, I love this one, I can't believe that a chef is cooking on an electric stove. Do you know somebody commented last week, I would never trust a chef Last week, this is the comment. I would never listen to a chef who cooked on an electric stove. That's pretty close-minded. <laughs> yeah, because if that's your judgment about it, you are asking the wrong questions. If you think the source of your heat matters at all, you're asking the wrong question. Heat is heat. Cooking is cooking. And a skilled cook can control the heat no matter what the source is. And I was told by a mentor chef long ago these words, and he was a cranky old son of a gun, this guy. He was like, eh, a good chef can cook on a hot rock. And I never forgot that. Because the right question to ask in this is what method should I use to apply my heat source? Watching how I cook the item and then do it in the kitchen, right? It, it, it doesn't have to do with, uh, again, how long, what brand, whether it's gas or electric or open fire or induction or any of it. It comes down to the results. What method will you apply to get the results that you want, whether it's electric or gas, it doesn't matter, or a hot rock <laughs> for that matter. Uh, all right, look, the next wrong question uh, actually makes me happy. <laughs> I, I like to get this wrong question because it's a challenge. There means That means to me that there is another mind out there for me to change, a new carefree cook in the making, and this is the question I get. You know I'm going to wince when I do this. You ready? Can I have the recipe? Oh, oh no, it's the wrong question when you're watching one of my videos, that's for sure. When you're watching one of my live broadcasts and it's the wrong question for a few reasons. First, you know there is no recipe. There, there will never be a recipe in one of my lessons. I don't read them, I don't write them, I don't follow them. There's no recipe for me to give you, okay? And that means, what, why this is the wrong question is because that means you're focusing, you're not focusing, on the methods, on the dependable and repeatable methods of cooking. It's like asking someone else if they would please be responsible for your cooking instead of you, right? When you have to have written instructions, it's like giving up the responsibility. So asking about written instructions is really the wrong question, better question. The right question is how do I watch what Chef Todd did? Or how do I watch what any chef did and then duplicate the method. Who cares what food they applied it to? But how do I do what they did, the steps they did, but use the foods that are right for my diet or my desires? That's the right question. How do I use the food that I got to eat 
for the way that that person did it. Forget about the written instructions. You're not going to be able to follow them anyway. If you hear a, like I've always said, if you play guitar and you hear a Beatles song and somebody gives you the sheet music to the Beatles tune, you don't sound like Paul McCartney. I guarantee it. It won't be the same. Okay. Similarly, here's another wrong question. Um, uh, chef, how much thyme, how much basil, how much chicken broth, how much rice, how much whatever, how much of it did you use? It's the wrong question. This is the question that goes along with recipes. This is the question that goes along with measuring things precisely, with thinking that somebody else has got this figured out for you and all you got to do is read their instructions. Unless you're baking, Unless we're talking about a baking formula, how much or how little of something you use is entirely within your control. The seasonings, the broths, the, the size of the protein product, the butter or the oils for saute, they're all decided by your tastes. They're all decided by what you have in mind for the end result of your dish. I don't care, add more pepper. If you like things peppery, add less broth if you want things drier. This is, you control it. And when you think that you have to read instructions to, to absolve yourself of the responsibility of cooking, this is terrifying to people. So when you put the control back in your hands, you say, I love pepper. I'm going to kill it with the pepper. I want it to be soupy. I'm going to add a whole bunch of chicken broth. That's the way it goes. And you know, this also touches on knowing, uh, on being confident in your cooking methods, right? Being able to recognize the effects of heat on food and make judgments. We, we touched on that just a minute ago. So the right question to all this is, if I add this much, if I add a tablespoon of oregano to this, what will the outcome be? Okay, this is really important. What will the outcome be? You start to get a taste memory in your head. Put some time in there, taste it. Now you know what it tastes like with the time, you know? Add more butter, taste it, and then you know in the future the effect that it's going to have. What is the result going to be for my tastes? Because we should always cook with the end result in mind, not somebody else's taste. The recipe offer, author, the recipe author might love pepper. <laughs> the recipe author might love a Chinese or Indian spice that you hate, but you're still going to add a whole tablespoon of it? Nah. <laughs> Cook with what you want. Cook with the end result in mind. Okay, here's another one. Sends a shiver down my spine. Uh, was that medium heat? What, or what dial, what number on the dial? Are you using, did you cook it number five or number three? These are immediately wrong questions because our stoves are different. Number five on my stove is an entirely different amount of heat than number five on your stove. There's no doubt about it. Heck, number five, if you think about it, isn't even the same from burner to burner on the same stove. Try that out at your house. Is number five so trustworthy? It's not, because if you just go from burner to burner, it's not the same on your stove, let alone this idea that there is a global standard for number five on every stove in the world. It's insane why you would trust number five ever. There's no such thing as medium heat. There's none. No such thing as medium heat. No such thing as medium low heat. It's relative. It's unquantifiable. You can't cook that way. The right question here to ask is, while looking down into the pan while you're cooking, you got to ask yourself, am I applying the right amount of heat right now? What, what, what's going on? in that pan? Is that going to get me the result that I want? It, the real question here is to ask yourself, am I controlling the heat correctly? And that, my friends, is the absolute key to all of cooking, is controlling the heat. So if, if your pan, right, if you're on number five on your dial and the thing is smoking, <laughs> putting out black smoke and setting the fire alarm, I'm thinking number five might not be it, you know? If you drive your car with the gas pedal all the way to the floor and you keep knocking over mailboxes, I think maybe you ought to take your foot off the pedal, right? That this is the idea. Maybe you should try number four. 
<laughs> for a little while. Maybe number three would help you out too. <sighs> you can see it drives me nuts. You, you can't depend on number five. All right, gotta move on. The next wrong question is one of a lack of, of uh, self-awareness, let's say, a, a lack of the awareness of the options that you really do have with your food because along your path to carefree cooking is gonna be some weird food, right? Maybe some stuff that you can't eat or you don't wanna eat. So the wrong question I get so often is, what if I can't eat onions? What, what, what if I can't eat, what if I don't like celery? Well, the answer is really simple to this. Leave it out, just don't eat it. It, it has nothing to do with the cooking method that you're applying. Use the foods that you like. Use the foods that are right for your diet. Use the foods that are most available, readily available to you. And again, this is where cooking methods comes in, right? Cooking by method. You don't ever need a substitution for a recipe that tells you how to cook something when you're the one that's writing the recipe. Doesn't that make sense? Only the recipes that somebody else has written do you need substitutions for. If you make it up your own, <laughs> you're not going to write in something that you can't eat. It's crazy. So the right question here is, how will I change th these ingredients for my diet or my desires? How will I keep the method, right? This goes back to the recipe thing before. How will I keep the method but change the ingredients that are right for my diet? And like I said before, when I said awareness, I, I didn't mean to sound harsh about this, but when I mean awareness, I mean, it's up to you to know what your substitutions are. If you have a special diet and you're unsure, you better do some research. You better speak with a dietitian or a nutritionist. Trust me, it's going to be worth your time and money. And that leads to the last long wrong question. It's very similar to this one, very similar to the previous one. And this is for the people that are on a restricted diet or have restricted their diet in some way. If you are gluten-free, lactose intolerant, uh, vegetarian, diabetic, low salt, low fat, uh, on the keto diet, uh, uh, doing the FODMAP, God forbid, uh, from your doctor, oh, that's so terrible. <laughs> it, it, it's up to you to take responsibility for your health through better food and cooking. So how do I make this for my whatever diet for my restricted diet, honestly, is not a question you've, you should ever be asking. You should know it already. You, you should never ask this question. If you're a diabetic and you want to know whether you can put sugar in the dish, you shouldn't be asking that question. If you're gluten-free, you want to know how much flour to put in, eh, wrong question. You should know the answer already. If your health depends on it, right? If your health depends on the food that you do or don't eat, don't ask me. I'm not a nutritionist or a dietitian. I mean, I'm serious. I'm sorry to sound harsh, but if you're lactose intolerant, you should know about alternative milks and cheeses. If you're diabetic, you should already know what you can't eat using different sugars, different oils, than you might see me demonstrate with. If you're gluten-free, you should know cold, by heart, three or four other types of flour that you know that you can use instead of wheat flour. It's, it's only because I care about you. I do. And if your food is your health, you got to know these answers ahead of time. Because the best thing you can do for yourself to move your cooking forward is to think carefully about the questions you're asking. Think carefully about the questions you're asking of me and of yourself, because you're not going to get, <laughs> throw in another analogy, you're not going to get the right driving directions to the beach if you ask someone how to get to the mountains. So when it comes to cooking, is your focus on cooking by time and temperature? Maybe more questions about the effects of heat on food and what to look for would bring you much quicker success than looking for another recipe. If you think precise measurement of the ingredients is the key to cooking and, and you always want to know how much, maybe you can start taking a little bit more of an artist's attitude toward your cooking, a little more laissez-faire, you know? May, heck, maybe you could just splash the paint against the canvas a few times and see what happens.
It might be a lot of fun. Ask the right questions and you get answers that actually help you. And you're going to be really glad that you did. Uh, let's see what kind of questions are being asked in our Carefree Cooks community for lifetime members of web cooking classes this week. Let's see who we got. Oh, Lisa. Lisa took advantage of me <laughs> asking the right questions about uh, why my biscuits were so bad. I don't know if you saw the first episode. I totally messed up my biscuits. They were terrible. 912 people watched me do it. Uh, she saw the B Biscuit Fix It episode I followed up with where I got the answers that I gave to myself and she made these beautiful biscuits. Nicely done. Uh, Eddie made himself a birthday dinner. Nice. Uh, he was taking all the right questions questions that he's been asking and he turned it into a marsala sauce. First time he's ever made marsala for his filet mignon. Happy birthday, Eddie. Nicely done. Uh, Laura got the right questions to her, uh, right answers to her questions about making a roasted butternut squash soup. She had never done it before. This is her first attempt and now the only question that she's being asked if she would please make it again. <laughs> uh, Deborah watched the balsamic scallops class from Thursday and asked just one question of herself. Hey, why can't I do that too? <laughs> I love this comment. Oh, this is the other thing she followed up on. She says, my family keeps asking if the dinner is from Chef Todd's lessons because they're the most new and exciting dinners. Great. Thank you so much, Deborah. I love that quote. Uh, look, and like I said before, you did it. I didn't. I just give you the ideas and methods. Ultimately, it's you that makes it really tasty and fun for your family. Uh, lastly, Carol, she might have asked the right question because this turned out to be the answer. Her take on a creamy mushroom soup class from just this last Saturday, add a grilled cheese and veggie sandwich, and the answer to her question is pride in having made a great lunch for herself. So before we end up, I've got a few questions for you now. Uh, what are you making for dinner? Uh, what cooking method are you going to use? Do you know any of this already? No? You haven't thought about it yet? Start thinking about it. Because if you think about what you're going to cook for dinner and what method you're going to use, then you start envisioning in your mind how you're going to cook it. And how is so much more powerful than what? It's called visualization. Visualization, I do it all the time. It is so good. It is so power powerful. Heather sees me almost every night. I'm like leaning against the kitchen counters. I might have my eyes closed even. And I go into what appears to be a, a total trance because I'm imagining it. I'm seeing it in my mind. I'm, I'm like, I'm going to heat the pan first. Uh, then I'm going to add the oil. Uh, will I add the aromatics first or should I do the chicken and then pull the chicken out and then the aromatics, right? That whole thing, I'll work the whole thing out in my head beforehand. And you know what that does? It brings up all the questions that I might have in advance so I can answer them myself before I start cooking. If you want to know how to ask the right questions and then immediately how to answer them yourself, it's visualization. Try it. Seriously, visualization. It gives you all the answers for sure. Oh, and before I give you with just a few minutes left, before I give you the answer to today's what am I, I've got a special announcement because tomorrow is it's the fifth trumpet, hand trumpet. Uh, it's the fifth anniversary of our Carefree Cooks community of lifetime members of web cooking classes on Facebook. It's so exciting. Tomorrow, uh, even though web cooking classes started in 2009, not only people could talk to me. They talked to me, I talked to them. So it wasn't until September 30th, 2015, when we created this Facebook community so that lifetime members could post their photos and interact with each other. And if you're not a lifetime member of web cooking classes, I have no idea why, because you're missing an opportunity to take your cooking to levels that you never even thought possible. And look, those aren't my words. That's what most of our members say, pretty much down to a person. And in honor of the fifth birthday of the Carefree Cooks community, I'm going to be doing something really special inside the private community tomorrow. I'll be posting that later today. But remember, it's only open to web cooking classes members that are in the community. All right, we'll see you tomorrow. We're going to do something really cool. Uh, so let's get back to the what am I for today. The combination of tomato, red pepper, olive oil, onion, and garlic in Spain has seven letters and it's called sofrito. 
sofrito, and a lot of Latin cuisines as well. Sofrito is Latin mirepoix. Got to come up with a different name from the French. The French think they invented it all. They didn't invent it. A chef once told me they were just the first to write it down. Uh, look, if you know someone that's got a lot of questions about cooking, but they're asking the wrong ones, please like and share this video with them so everyone can get the answers that they really need. And if you want the answers to all the cooking questions that you might be wondering about, uh, they might be found in my free online class. It's three cooking discoveries to change your food from fair to fantastic. And these are, these are three powerful discoveries in this 40 minute class that's gonna bring, enable you to bring them right back into your kitchen immediately. So if you go to webcookingclasses.com slash discover, you can find a class time that's right for you. Like I said, 40 minutes and it's free. Check it out. So until next Tuesday, where we take even more steps toward breaking the Carefree Cooks Code, this is Chef Todd Moore reminding you that there's a method to your unquestionable <laughs> cooking success. Bye, everyone.